And, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, my name is Simon Hopkins. I'm based at Mill Trust's offices in Singapore, but like all of us, currently hold up at home. And um, I'm very delighted to be joined by a number of my colleagues, including Griff Williams, who is the Chief Investment Officer of the British Innovation Fund, and uh, Guy Pengeli, our Investment Director, who is also on the call. We had launched the British Innovation Fund some three years ago now, and a very large uh, proportion of our focus has been in the healthcare realm. Um, and uh, two of the investee companies that uh, reside in that portfolio are joining us today. Uh, and I'm very delighted to welcome Nigel Clark, who is the uh, chairman of Atomarka. Uh, and um, I'm also very delighted to be joined, I think, from the US, Bill, if that's not uh, incorrect. Bill Enright, who's the chief executive of Vaxitech. Uh, these two companies are very important components of our portfolio. And most importantly, they have a, a direct uh, focus on COVID-19. In fact, uh, in terms of their particular focus, they have uh, pivoted, I think it's fair to say, uh, quite a considerable amount of their energy into uh, pursuing uh, both um, a, an antibody test, in fact, a multiplex test from Atomarka, uh, a company that span out of the University of Exeter that we invested in a couple of years ago, and um, at Vaxitech, a company that has been heavily involved in immunology but has a wider uh, oncology platform, which Bill will tell us more about, um, and was, in fact, one of the first companies uh, to uh, enter the space of uh, devising a vaccine uh, in the coronavirus arena uh, with work um, uh, that they undertook to uh, tackle the, uh, the MERS crisis, uh, the Middle East respiratory crisis of a couple of years ago. So welcome, gentlemen, and I'll be handing over to you shortly to give uh, a detailed um, expose of exactly what you're doing. Uh, our third guest, who's with me, uh, not literally with me, but in spirit, I'm sure he is, Vas Metapal, is a doctor who trained at King's in the UK. Um, he went on to become a consultant radiologist and is now a two-time entrepreneur, having uh, launched with uh, his colleague, Dr. Patel, um, a, a fascinating business, which has become one of the world's fastest growing uh, telemedicine businesses. It's based here in Singapore and it's called MyDoc. And uh, Dr. Vaz uh, will be also telling us a little bit about what's going on uh, with respect to uh, the evolution of this disease here in Asia. Uh, from his experience on the ground in uh, six Asian countries uh, where he is uh, at the uh, forefront of uh, consulting with patients um, it, through the MyDoc platform. So um, I'm going to uh, first introduce um, Nigel Clark, who will give us some background on Atomarker and uh, particularly uh, some information as to uh, where Atomarka is with respect to the development of an antibody test, uh, which is something that we're very excited about uh, in the Atomarka stable. Nigel. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, uh Thank you all for your time. Um, I'll be very quick. Atomarka is essentially a blood testing company. Um, what we have developed is a form of point of care blood test from a single prick of blood, um, which can be performed in five minutes. Um, our ultimate objective is a handheld device, which we've already um, developed. But in the short term, and what I, when we're talking about COVID-19, we're actually talking about a bench top device um, which is available already and, uh, and being used. Um, how this works is very straightforward. Uh, there is a chip in the device 
which has 170 uh, gold nanoparticles printed on it, and which is then uh, of, of, uh, functionalized by uh, printing addition and, uh, uh, and uh, an array of uh, additional elements on it, which in the case of COVID-19 are going to be the recombinant, recombinant antigens S1 and S2, which, are the, which detect spikes on the, on the virus, and the nuclear capsid protein, along with the SARS membrane and envelope proteins. It will also perform a C-reactive protein test, which is effectively a test of inflammation it effectively tells you that a patient is very ill. And I can tell you that the tests we're doing at the moment indicate that people who had COVID-19 are indeed very ill, um, but, but they tend to be in hospitals, of course, by that stage. Um, so what we have done recently, once this started, we developed a new chip that would test for those five uh, antibodies along with uh, C-reactive protein simultaneously. And this is what makes Atomarca unique. It, it is a multiplex testing system. It's possible to do all of these tests simultaneously from the single prick of blood, which allows you to much faster assessment. Um, it also means that you don't need to be taking blood in quantity from patients, nor do you need to ship it off to path labs. You can do it in front of the patient at the time. Um, we've now been testing in St. Thomas's Hospital, which in, in today is of course part of King's, um, in London for the last four weeks in conjunction with them. That those tests are going to produce a research paper which is going to be submitted for publication either today or tomorrow. And Thomas itself is now finalizing validation of the tests with a view to putting the device into play in its hospitals as soon as possible. Um, where we are looking at using the technology immediately is on, first of all, staff surveillance. It will be, it, it, there is already testing going on, but hospital staff can be placed under daily surveillance, which allows immunity to be followed. It allows pr the hospital to promote immune staff to frontline work and to test self-isolating staff to ensure whether they have or haven't actually got the disease. It also allows for uh, triaging patients at the door to the hospital to allow the immune patients to be allocated to a green care pathway, the non-immune patients can then be properly treated with additional care in the COVID-19 wards. It also allows, uh, ultimately, the authentication of immunity. Now, there are some big questions. One of the things this test is doing, of course, is, is determining uh, knowledge of the disease that we simply did not have before. Nobody actually knows what the half-life of the antibodies for COVID-19 are going to be. Um, and that makes a huge difference to how quickly you can end lockdown, for example, um, and get economies moving again, which is a hugely significant political factor in this. Um, the ultimately, and this is maybe relevant to some of you, in the future, uh, we will be able to use these tests to, to assist in vaccine validation. So in other words, we can test the efficacy of, uh, of vaccines by measuring in the field degrees of herd immunity uh, in order to suppress the threat from the disease as a whole. So we are now in discussions with a manufacturer to industrialize the process of the benchtop device. The chips for use in the device are already being produced at volume in Berlin. Um, and as part of this, we, as Simon, I think, has said in the, in the documentation, we're looking for a final, um, well, what is the equivalent of about 7 million US dollars to complete our Series A round, which allows us to develop this at volume, but also to continue with the production of the handheld device and complete the regulatory processes for that. So I think that's that in summary. Um, uh, and I'm all yours, as they say. Thanks very much, Nigel. Um, that's really exciting developments at Atomarker. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, the next uh, speaker to introduce his company at this point. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Bill Enright, Chief Executive of Vaxitech, to tell us a little bit about the broader platform at the company, but also the important work that they're doing in the search for a vaccine. And perhaps get a little bit of perspective from Bill 
on uh, how realistic it is that we could expect to see a vaccine uh, in short order. Development of vaccines is a notoriously lengthy process. So it'd be very interesting to hear uh, what you have to say about comments that the, uh, the development of a vaccine will be a very important aspect of getting back to normal. Over to you, Bill. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, so uh, as Simon said, I'm the CEO of Vaxitech, and uh, Vaxitech is an immunotherapeutics company. Uh, we have uh, both uh, immunotherapeutics to uh, target chronic infectious diseases like HBV and HPV, as well as oncology. And then uh, the platform that we're utilizing is also very effective uh, for prophylactic settings uh, as well. So we, we utilize uh, for the immunotherapeutic side, it's a, a prime boost approach where we're priming uh, the immune system with a, a chimp adeno that has the antigen of interest. And then for the immunotherapeutic applications, uh, we come back with a, another live viral vector with the same antigen to stimulate the largest potential CD8 positive T cell response that anybody has seen in man. And, uh, and those uh, T cells are long lasting and uh, are multifunctional. And, uh, and so we have a, a, a good progress on the HPV, HPV in, in oncology. For the, for the prophylactic vaccines, uh, we only need the, the chimp adeno because uh, in, in many of these pro prophylactic indications such as um, COVID-19 or SARS or MERS, uh, the antibody response is, is key to uh, protection. Uh, so on the COVID-19 side, uh, as Simon mentioned, we're, we've been involved with coronavirus vaccines for, for quite some time. We're one of the few companies that has shown that we can uh, develop neutralizing antibodies in people with a single vaccination. Uh, and, and that was work done with our colleagues at the University of Oxford on the MERS vaccine, uh, where we demonstrated both a, a very robust T cell response as well as uh, neutralizing antibodies in a phase one, two study in the UK. And we actually were currently enrolling a second study uh, looking at different dosing regimens in Saudi Arabia at present when the, uh, when the outbreak occurred with uh, COVID-19. So we got, uh, as soon as the sequence was published, again, in collaboration with our scientific founders at the Univ University of Oxford, we designed a, a vaccine very similar to the MERS targeting the spike protein and, uh, and move that forward quite quickly. Uh, we already have mouse immunogenicity data. Uh, we'll have primate non-human uh, non primate data uh, next week in a challenge model. Uh, key there is showing uh, immunopathology. It's one of the concerns uh, that, that people saw with SARS. And so we wanted to make sure that we had those data before moving into people, which will be in it, uh, before the end of this month. Um, the, the, uh, the regulatory agencies, uh, particularly the MHRA, know this technology platform quite well. They've been working with us and being quite flexible here. And, uh, and we have a, an, an adaptive trial design, a phase one, two, three adaptive trial design. So the first study uh, will be in 500 people. Uh, that, that started recruiting um, a few weeks ago. And as you can imagine, uh, we had no trouble recruiting. So we had over 6,000 responses uh, for 500 people. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we believe we'll be able to enroll that quite or dose that quite quickly um, once we have the, uh, the non-human primate data. So we should be the, the first company in the world to have efficacy data with a vaccine. And, and we're expecting that in the uh, late July, uh, early August timeframe. 
So the, uh, the, the phase one will, the phase one, two will be quick, quickly followed up with the phase two, three, where we'll be looking at 5,000 volunteers uh, and also different age groups. So it, it's quite exciting. We're moving quite quickly. We're, we're also um, uh, working with the European regulators and the US regulators uh, to try and harmonize what's being done in the UK. Uh, and simultaneously, uh, we are setting up manufacturing around the world uh, at various manufacturing sites uh, so that we can potentially produce millions of doses of the vaccine as quickly as possible. So, uh, you know, to your question, can we do this quickly? I think the answer is yes. I think we have a relatively high probability of success here uh, because of what we've already accomplished with a similar vaccine in MERS. And uh, um, you know, we, won't have, we won't have enough vaccine to, to treat the whole world this year, but I think you know, we'll be in the millions of doses this year and in tens to hundreds of millions of doses next year. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, just a very quick question. Uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the landscape of, of people who say they're working on a vaccine, there are something like 115 different companies around the world who leapt onto the bandwagon. Um, how realistic is it that you, you know, what's, what is the genuine uh, competitive field look like? And Bill Gates and organizations like CEPI um, are throwing an enormous amount of money at vaccines. Um, is, is their money going to be critical? Uh, is, it, is it going to take an extraordinary amount of additional capital to get where you want to be? Uh, that would be sort of typically outside the realm of a, of a normal fundraise for a, for a spin-out company from Oxford University? No, absolutely. I think um, to, you know, to the, the, the speed at which we're progressing here is unprecedented uh, for, for any kind of drug development, much less a vaccine, which you know, typically takes uh, you know, close to 10 years in, in normal, uh, normal development scenarios. So it, this is uh, this is unbelievable, and in the scale at which we're going to need uh, manufacturing is, is also unprecedented. You know, there are 7.8 billion people on the planet right now, um, and uh, you know, vaccines are going to be needed by a large majority of those. So uh, the the amount of manufacturing firepower that's required it will take a significant amount of capital. And uh, so, you know, to your point, I think uh, there's a lot of different uh, avenues being being tried on the vaccine front. Um, it's likely to be more than one vaccine that makes it to market and uh, and, and is effective. Uh, people are trying, you know, very standard, um, uh, I would say, quote unquote, old fashioned uh, protein based vaccines. Um, some of them with adjuvants, some of them without, and then they're trying newer technologies, so RNA and DNA and, uh, and viral vectors. So I think there's a lot of avenues being explored here. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, we're one of the only companies that actually has human data showing that we can do this with a single dose. Um, I'm going to now move uh, straight on to uh, Dr. Vaz from uh, Singapore. And uh, Vaz, would you give us a little, a little bit of uh, an insight into what your business is doing, uh, how your time has been obviously very much uh, consumed by the current crisis, um, but also a little bit of uh, information uh, that uh, gives us an idea of what telemedicine is, how telemedicine is likely to evolve as a consequence of this uh, of this crisis. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Vaz uh, Mentapali, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, MyDoc, which is based in Singapore. Uh, we started about eight years ago. Me and my co-founder are both physicians, uh, Dr. Snehal Patel, who's from the US. Um, 
we were both uh, in the uh, region setting up medical centers and uh, setting up radiology network for myself. Um, and what we realized was that there will never be enough uh, physical clinics that we could set up for the population and the growth and uh, there is in Asia. And um, one of the inspiration really for my doc was also looking at the UK GP uh, landscape and how every, every person in the UK could say who their GP is. Um, but in Asia, it was difficult to identify who your GP was. Um, we wanted to build a digital platform that could provide a primary care uh, to the masses as well as uh, to the region uh, in general. And um, when, when we did set off and set up the platform, uh, it was early, seven years ago, but um, the way we went about getting collaborative efforts with like local medical groups, labs, as well as um, diagnostic facilities, uh, getting a patient health record going. So there were a lot of components that, that brought uh, this platform together. So the digital health platform that we have created is more like an ecosystem that enables uh, doctors and uh, medical groups to get online. Uh, so it was a bit of a digital transformation that we were driving initially to get the medical groups online and then uh, getting uh, patients online. So getting patients online was um, uh, initially difficult, uh, but as uh, payers and uh, corporates saw the convenience factor of uh, providing primary care to all their staff or members of their insurance panel uh, that, that they could provide uh, online GP care, things got uh, better and over the last three years, uh, I would say the adoption has been really good um, in terms of the region and catching up with the rest of the world in terms of in the West with uh, in the US and UK we're leading with a lot of telehealth uh, platforms as well. Um, what we saw over the last three months, I would say is kind of unprecedented as well um, with COVID. Uh, uh, it, it hit Singapore pretty early, late January, when we were uh, kind of uh, uh, looking at it as, um, you know, a sudden surge of cases online, asking for uh, upper respiratory infections, uh, being reviewed online uh, rather than visiting their clinics. So we did see there's a lot of anxiety as well in this. And uh, we started a campaign called CureYourFear.org. And we, that was one of the first telehealth campaigns that uh, really took off uh, uh, around, around the region. And uh, we had partners um, in Malaysia, in, in Hong Kong, and, um, and now Thailand as well. And uh, we have been able to provide online consultations and I would say the last few months, the behavior change that has uh, come about, uh, hope I think it would last uh, over the over the uh, in the future as well, and um, so it's a more of a long term change in in how uh, it's not going to uh, probably die down, and the first wave is all about access to care, but what we see um, going forward. When, when there's a uh, need for chronic disease management and identifying those at risk because th they are the ones that probably would need uh, more help uh, in the second wave of this. And um, I think uh, hearing how uh, the diagnostic kits uh, will be out soon with Atomaka vaccines coming out, I think it's, it's all a, a good ecosystem uh, that we can create um, with online care as part of it as well. So we don't replace the current healthcare system, but we augment that. So I think there is gonna be uh, a bit of a change with uh, medical groups much more uh, aware of, of 
of telemedicine now as part of everyday practice. So we see the governments providing a lot of support. Um, they have been uh, providing subsidized uh, uh, platform access to the clinics so that they can engage with the patients, uh, at least in Singapore, as well as in the US, uh, they have been uh, opening up uh, the, the, platform, the, the, the services such that um, across the states, uh, doctors can practice uh, beyond, beyond their borders of the state. And, and that really helps as well in telemedicine. And uh, I think this is something that uh, hopefully will uh, increase um, uh, utilization as well. And it has been happening. So, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, that's something we are, we are part of. And going forward, I think uh, in Southeast Asia at least, uh, we see uh, Indonesia as potentially our next market that we are likely going to um, enter as well. We are already in five markets in Southeast Asia. Uh, we work with some of the top insurers and we hope that um, with, with the current uh, uh, round as well, we are in the middle of a Series B round. And with that, I think we can uh, expand our operations. Uh, and uh, cater for the primary care uh, in the region as a whole. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Vas. I mean, what I think is incredibly comforting uh, and very different from perhaps a decade ago is at a time when most of our news flow comes from politicians and sensationalist journalists, uh, we are able to access directly uh, the medical profession remotely um, and, and get sensible information and real analysis uh, of what is going on uh, and what to expect uh, and how to interpret the data and statistics that's coming out uh, in, in, a, uh, in a more rational fashion. Uh, and that is uh, one of the great services that um, uh, medicine businesses like my doc are able to facilitate. Uh, Nigel, um, I'd like to come back to you. Uh, with respect to Atomarker, for many people, uh, when they hear about tests, they are most familiar with the swab test that has been widely uh, publicized and is being carried out in increasingly in scale. The difference between the swab test and the app may need some clarification, the difference between those two tests. And I think it would be very helpful uh, for you to give us an understanding of who else is out there with a credible antibody test? Because people do mix up the language of the, um, of the antigen test, the test to see whether you have the virus, and the antibody, the serological antibody test, uh, which is so important for establishing whether you can go back into the community and work because you have uh, developed immunity. Essentially, the, the swab test is an RNA test, uh, and it appears to have no better than 80% accuracy. Um, there may be some good reasons for that. If you're taking the swab from the back of somebody's throat or the back of their nose, uh, the disease has to be present there. We have noted in Tommy's that for some patients who test negative, but who have clearly got the virus, the reason they appear to have tested negative was because the, the virus was actually present in the lungs, but not present in the nose or throat at the time. And that a day later, after a, you know coughing fits and so forth, actually people do then test positive. But you can see that in the in the um, uh, the tests that we're doing, the antibody tests. Uh, the main thing I think you've noticed with the antibody is you're really looking at the body's response to the disease, not whether the body, not whether you've got the disease or not. Um, you're seeing one of the things we've noted in Tommy's is that by and large antibodies take nine days to be produced by the body after the first reporting of symptoms. And what we don't know is why some people have very few symptoms. Some people are clearly carriers of the disease without in any way otherwise being recognizable why some people have real difficulty responding. We do know that there are clearly associated secondary factors 
associate other healthcare conditions, for example, there is clearly a very strong link between people's inability to fight the disease and smoking, um, which will come out during the course of this. But um, you know, all the things that we already know about um, it, diseases uh, or conditions that make people more vulnerable towards respiratory disease um, are all quite marked. Um, I'll give you an obvious example of, of, of type 2 diabetes. Um, but uh, what the tests are, are doing, we are learning a lot about the disease itself. There are some critical things about protection which relate to the half-life of the antibodies. One of the other things that the multiplex testing does, and a lot of, of what is going on at the moment is single tests for antibodies. We don't think that's probably adequate. You actually have to be testing for more than one thing at a time to get a proper picture of the disease in the patient and of the degree of protection. It, a lot of the antibody tests are for the spikes. Uh, that's the, if you, we all recall what the virus looks like, it's the detection of the spikes themselves. There seems to be some very preliminary evidence that the people who most effectively fight the disease are the people who see the spikes earliest and, and, and mobilize the body's uh, immune system very quickly. The people who are getting very ill have not responded well to the spikes, respond to the nuclear capsid, which is a much better indication of how well they cope later with fighting the disease off. Um, what we are learning is that it's possible that COVID-19 may have a much shorter antibody life, the half-life, than, for example, happened with SARS, where the, the half-life is about 100 days. And you, roughly speaking, get protection over a period of three half-lives. So you're getting on for a year's protection from SARS, which clearly was a, a big factor in it not becoming a huge uh, pandemic. It's not clear that people aren't getting reinfected with COVID-19, having had it within a relatively short period of time of their first exposure to the disease. That's the kind of thing that multiplex testing can reveal and it's where we're headed at the moment. So it, the simple thing is, this isn't a test for have you got the disease, it sits alongside that. It's much more important for how do we get everybody back to work uh, safely. Yeah. That, that's great. I mean, for people who aren't familiar with Tommy's, um, St. Uh, St. Thomas's you know, Hospital opposite, uh, opposite the Houses of Parliament. It was in the, in the news recently because it's where the British Prime Minister was treated when he got COVID-19. Absolutely. I, I'm leaders. unable to tell you whether we tested them or not. Among them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to come back to um, my second question, Nigel. Um, other serious players in this space are there a, is there anybody else that you have encountered on this journey who appears to have uh, a serious competing antibody test i mean you know there must be many people working on this but what has been notably notably absent is talk of uh, antibody tests certainly from the uk perspective uh, that can be rolled out in scale. Um, are there anybody, is there anybody else close to this, do we think? Well, there's no doubt that Abbott have an antibody test which they can roll out at scale, but it is a single test. It is not a multiplex test. And our, the, the research and work with Tommy's indicates that you get a more complete picture of what you're looking at if you can test for more than one antibody simultaneously. Those tests are also take rather longer um, the complete turnaround for an atomarker test is 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. in seven and a half minutes to do the test, two and a half minutes to reset the machine. And you can do that uh, alongside the patient, essentially. Um, so there are clear differences. But as you rightly point out, there are a lot of people working on antibodies at the moment. They just aren't doing it in the same kind of way. Yeah. Okay, Bill, um, I'm going to move ac across to you now uh, at Vaxitech. I should point out that Vaxitech was a spin out of the uh, prestigious Jenner Institute at Oxford University. Um, for those of you who will know of Jenner, he discovered the uh, 
the vaccination for smallpox, uh, and um, we uh, that is the, the organisation that uh, that gave birth to Vaxitech some years ago. Uh, Vaxitech is currently raising money. Bill, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, your fundraise at the moment? Uh, sure. So uh, we're actually in the middle of a Series B funding. So we've got uh, a good syndicate of investors that um, uh, that did the seed funding and Series A, uh, including Oxford Science Innovation, uh, as well as GV, uh, which is formerly Google Ventures, uh, Sequoia uh, Capital China, Korean Investment Partners, which is the largest group in Korea, uh, as well as uh, what's now Lion Trust, uh, formerly Neptune. So uh, we've got a good syndicate in the, in the group. Um, you know, we're looking at a, a $55 million raise uh, that was uh, primarily focused on our, our current platform before the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, adding that into the pipeline, um, we have been allocated a 50 million euro uh, non-dilutive facility to help us uh, on scale up with manufacturing. Uh, we've been awarded uh, at least preliminarily uh, some monies from NIH on the uh, US studies, uh, but we'll be, we'll be looking to uh, increase the race um, probably up to the 200 million uh, range uh, to deal with the, uh, the COVID-19. Bill, just uh, in terms of the competitive landscape again and how you collaborate uh, with the other participants, perhaps, you know, members of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations and so on. Um, one of the things I think that is always a challenge is how to fully immerse yourself in a um, competitive but uh, um, collaborative effort. I mean, you, you are a private enterprise, you have your own IP, and yet, um, you know, there is a... Uh, a worldwide search going on for uh, a vaccine uh, where you can clearly play a very important role with the work that you've done around um, other coronaviruses. What is, what is the working arrangement like? You're dealing with com countries, companies from countries all over the world, including China. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it effective? Is it actually making progress? So uh, I think it, you know, in, in this particular instance, when it's a you know global pandemic issue and the number of folks that are dying as a result, I, I think m people have been much more collaborative, and uh, I think you're, you're finding um, people are much more willing to share data and information than uh, you know in in typical um, you know competitive issues. Uh, the, the, the overriding goal, I think, for everyone is to get as many doses of vaccine out there as quickly as possible. And so I think that that's a, that's a shared goal by a lot of different people. I think there's room for, for multiple vaccines, as, as I mentioned. And so I, I think people in general are being, um, are being good about that. I, you know, there's obviously you're still as a company um, trying to make sure that you have uh, the ability to to make money and to um, advance the company. Um, I think you know one of the concerns uh, that that I've noted is in discussions with various entities, everyone is concerned about uh, nationalism and uh, vaccine being made in a certain country that never gets out of the country. And, uh, and you know, or at least until everyone within that country is vaccinated. So again, that's one of the reasons for looking at multiple manufacturing opportunities uh, around the world. Uh, it's partly because of the large number of doses that are going to be re required, but also uh, to ensure that uh, no one hoards or uh, unduly prices these these uh, these products.
Dr. Vaz, uh, in Singapore, um, Singapore was held out as, a, as the great model for the rest of the world in terms of its um, methodology for controlling the spread, the early spread of, of the virus. I think there's a growing uh, recognition that we have um, many, many more people who have the virus. They may be, as Nigel pointed out, asymptomatic. They may have had a mild cold. The numbers of people that I know who've had uh, some form of flu over the course of this winter that normally we wouldn't encounter here in Singapore seems to be uh, pointing to the fact that the virus is more widespread. Um, we're about to undertake 200,000 tests of migrant workers here in Singapore because we've had an outbreak uh, amongst that community. Do you think that there is going to be a sort of sea change in the way people look at the numbers and think, well, the numbers of people that actually have this disease are, are less relevant uh, because the more people who are tested, the more numbers we will see who have the disease and the morbidity rate, the number of people who are dying of the disease as a percentage of those who contracted it will fall dramatically. And how will that, uh, how will that change people's attitude to things like lockdown uh, and uh, the methods that we're using currently to control the disease? Um, thanks, Simon. I must say um, the last uh, 90 days has uh, hasn't really zoomed past. Every day is like a learning curve, uh, as much as the crisis is a curve on its uh, on its own, right? Uh, the learning curve that the doctors are going through, the learning curve that the Ministry of Health is going through, uh, or the government is going through, it's not easy. Uh, and the communication is the main reason why I think Singapore uh, is responding fast on the feet, right, at all times. Like, we get direct messages from Ministry of Health. Uh, within a day, they will say, I'll open up uh, chronic disease management for the for, uh, for reimbursement with telemedicine, right? And within two days, everything gets done and, and, and uh, we are able to start doing that stuff. So I, what I, I think is uh, that, um, uh, I guess as being in a smaller country, we are able to uh, respond uh, to these changes. And all the countries will go through this, I think, the second wave and, and the, 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 the way that they should be prepared. Um, and getting back to work is going to be another big uh, issue. And uh, that's where the testing and, and, and where... Uh, we just heard with, from Atomaka's uh, experience as well uh, that this is going to be important going forward to find out who can really get back to work. And uh, when um, Singapore just started its lockdown, we, we may have uh, waited, but end of the day, our hospitals are not overrun. We have space. We are able to cope um, the number of deaths are low. Um, I think the, 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 the system is working. Um, and what we need to do is, again, like take away the barriers, communicate more, ensure that uh, the government and the medical providers are, are working in step with each other. And I think the rest of the region has a bigger challenge uh, sometimes, but now uh, we have to share and, and be part of this region as well. So I think uh, whatever we have learned here, we have to, um, probably Indonesia is where a lot of it is gonna be applied going forward. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't uh, go beyond Jakarta or too, too much beyond um, uh, the main cities, yeah. Yes, it certainly isn't impacting every country in the same way. That, that is 
patently clear. Thank you. Well, I received a, a number of questions, so thanks for that. So one is for the, uh, with respect to the vaccine, uh, is it likely to be a one-off vaccine or is it going to be a yearly thing like the flu? Um, and one of the early questions of that is, uh, what's the likelihood that a vaccine development might fail, uh, just like AIDS or, or, or which doesn't have a vaccine up to today? Uh, you know, on one hand, it's too early to tell uh, from uh, whether or not we're going to have to do this on an annual basis. I think, you know, the good news is uh, so far we've seen very little mutation in the in the spike protein, which is required for binding uh, to, to move uh, the virus into the cell. And so that bodes well that, um, that a, a single vaccine will work or how long, the, you know, what the duration of immunity I think that's uh, that's been talked about a little bit on this call already, and so so that'll have to be determined uh, over time. Uh, I, I think you know as far as uh, um, the probability of success here, I think coronavirus is uh, in general uh, are much less complicated than the HIV virus and and, uh, and the latency that we've seen there, and, and so I think based on the success we've seen in MERS, I think the probability of success is higher. Um, but, you know, it, it, this is a, a newly emerging virus, and I think we still have a lot to learn. Next question is probably for Nigel. On the antibody tests, we believe that some are, are happening in Germany already. These are not multiplex. Is there a risk that they will start issuing immunity passports to people who are not immune? The answer is we don't know the answer to that yet, except that we are finding out more about levels of immunity all the time. Um, I think that the answer is yes, there is a risk, undoubtedly. And I'm pretty sure that most of the medical authorities are aware of that. Um, it, it's, it's a question of, of doing the necessary tests in order to determine it. Um, there is an enormous pressure there, you'll understand, on all politicians to get uh, lockdown removed as quickly, get economies moving as quickly as possible. So they've got to balance it out. And, it, and this is a straightforward uh, understanding risk, risk reward, basically. But if we did it too early, there is every risk that we would not get rid of it. It would just come back again at, at, at a greater degree. We're learning all the time. It's the simple answer. I have a few questions for Vass. So with increased testing, there's increased data gathering and therefore more data points for analytics. However, how do companies like MyDog capture this, process it, and are able to share this data and an analysis cross national borders? What G2G level discussions are being had to enable the sharing of this information? So that's an interesting question. Um, so. One difference between MyDoc and many other telemedicine platforms is that we don't look at it as only a Skype a doctor or, or a video-based uh, uh, platform. We have a patient health record as a base, and um, we are connected to the labs uh, to collect data uh, in each of these countries uh, that we operate in. Um, we try to personalize care for the patient. So chronic diseases, getting all the records in place together so that we can provide more than just GP care. We have allied health professionals like dietitians and others on the platform to reduce the risk of, of chronic diseases affecting immunity and others. I mean, getting better control and so on. So talking about data across countries, we don't really need to cross borders. We provide healthcare providers within the country. So the patient health record is stored within the country. The algorithms that we learn for personalizing care, that can be shared between the countries. And uh, so bring up uh, personalizing, uh, the uh, finding out about certain like diabetes markers and trying to follow up with these patients. We use the same, same chatbot, for example, across multiple countries uh, that can engage with the, with the patients. So yeah, the learnings can be shared, but the medical providers licensed in each country will be the ones providing care for the last mile in, in each of these countries.
Okay, just uh, another question for you, Dr. Vass. Uh, are, are there specialties that lend themselves better to telemed? That's an interesting question as well, because initially everyone thought uh, it will be dermatology or it'll be just a few special specialist sectors. But now everyone is coming up with conditions within each speciality that are more uh, readily uh, treatable or, 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 or those that can be diagnosed uh, with telemedicine. So every specialty has some, uh, something, some symptoms that can be evaluated with telemedicine. So telemedicine can be really part of everyday practice for most doctors. But uh, gentlemen, it was a really fascinating uh, opportunity to hear from you. Nigel, um, you have, you're on the verge of something really quite significant uh, with the development of the antibody test and we'll be watching very closely for news over the course of the next few days. I do want to stress that Atomarker is more than a COVID antibody test. It's a platform. I think uh, Professor Andrew Shaw has done over 156 separate assays in his laboratory for different biomarkers in the blood. And um, you know, this is, uh, this is a, a diag point of care diagnostics business that can uh, have many uh, applications uh, going forward. And uh, Bill, um, very, very good to hear from you. Good luck with the fundraise. Uh, we hope we can find some uh, uh, investors with you. I don't think uh, the credentials of your company could be stronger, a spin out of the Jenner Institute and uh, at the forefront of work uh, within the realm of Corona viruses. Um, we wish you well and hope that you are the, uh, are the first to, uh, to the vaccine, which is going to release us from this misery. Dr. Vaz, um, fascinating to hear from you in Singapore. Thank you very much. I think this work uh, is going to be enormously important. We're here on a, a Zoom call. We're all getting very used to communicating with other professionals using these tools. Uh, telehealth really has come of age uh, in, this, uh, in the most uh, unfortunate of circumstances. And I think uh, mental health will also be a very important area uh, where we'll be needing the assistance of uh, our medical colleagues. Um, British innovation at this time is, is really uh, producing some fantastic uh, companies, some wonderful science, um, tech and medical innovation and therapies. We need to continue the flow of money moving towards this sector. That's really our message, and that's the reason we set up the fund. Once again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Guy, uh, our investment director. He'll be answering a lot of the questions that you are sending through. Uh, please do keep sending them through. Keep the emails coming, and we will endeavor to follow up with you. And uh, once again, thank you for participating, and good night and good afternoon.